you've you've definitely had to had a, 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 a mindset shift uh, over the past years. Uh, you know, from just being able to offer some level of service when a disruption kicks in, uh, or having to lift and shift everything to an alternate facility or facilities. Uh, you know, when we have a major disruption to our operational capability. So, and hence uh, the the thought around resilience and cyber resilience in particular. And I'm based on a lot of research that the, the team and I uh, did uh, back at where I, where I work. Um, and it, it 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 soon became evident that it's not just a, a spot upgrade of uh, your traditional BCP DRP. It's actually an amal- amalgamation of a, a lot of uh, other dimensions that come along to to build what's known as cyber resilience. I'll I'll, I'll get into the definitions uh, as we go. Um, so I've got a fairly good amount of slides. So do buckle up and and and, and brace in. And uh, in terms of questions, I'm not too sure how you, you usually do it. Uh, I prefer to have it at the end of the session so I can you know, make sure I can deliver the content. Uh, and then and we, I, mean, I don't have a hard stop at the end of the hour, so I can stay back for some more time in case there's additional questions. So with that, uh, let's let's move into the actual subject. So before I do that, and as with any presentation, I've, I've, I've had to give, uh, obviously I'm doing this in a personal and professional capacity. So anything that you, you see and hear are, are, are purely my professional and, and personal opinions and not necessarily that of my organization. So about myself, uh, uh, I'm just a few months short of two decades of, of being in the cybersecurity uh, management and operation space. Uh, about 13 years of that has been in, in aviation security. Uh, I've, I've had the privilege and the blessings to work with uh, some really big brands over the over the years. Uh, started my career with Schlumberger. For those of you who may not know it, it's an oil and gas company. The next one also happened to be an oil and gas, which is Total, the French oil company. Um, you know, that was in association with uh, arrangements that they had they, they had for Schlumberger. And then eventually, I moved on back to the parent uh, company with Schlumberger with Atos Origin. Uh, and then uh, at some point of time, I did do a project for. Uh, you know, some of my clients and, and, and then they came about asking if I was interested to, to move into helping them support a build up a program. Uh, Reem's already gone through my set of certifications and, and, and thankfully that's, that's helped me over the years to, to complement the, the experience and exposure that we have. Uh, uh, I've, I've been a member of Gartner's uh, you know, Middle East Risk and uh, Security Advisory event uh, for the past uh, four to five years. Um, essentially, we're, we're a group that's from across the GCC that get involved in designing these events, uh, especially the Gartner security events. And we also provide a lot of feedback into regional, regional contexts and ch- changes that's happened, uh, you know, within, across different industries and different, uh, you know, across different hierarchies of, of the organizations that we operate at. Uh, personally, for me, I, I have two principles or mantras that I touch upon. One is that security is not a transaction. It's not seasonal definitely has to be practiced as a culture. And the other thing, uh, as with anything, technology or otherwise, you know, if, if, if you're not in the game, uh, you, you're out of it. And when I mean, when I mean in the game, uh, it, it has to go a lot with uh, you know, forcing yourself to leave tradition. Um, and you know, a lot of the innovation and emerging capabilities that's being built up in our space, uh, you, know, you need to have an open mindset when you, when you, when you go into those things. And, and security is no different. If you've got adversaries using AI and machine learning and and menu driven, you know, with, with shopping carts and 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 uh, supply and uh, support chains uh, in their own ecosystem, uh, we shouldn't be the one who who who's second best at that. You know, we should ideally be ahead of that and and try to match and if not exceed uh, their capabilities. And and as as Reem said, thankfully uh, last week I finished my my master's program, so I'm just waiting for my results to come through. Uh, and as a piece of specialization um, in I felt it was it was worthwhile. I, I contribute back to, you know, the, the community that we are in, which and and, and the focus of my my dissertation has been uh, cybersecurity and in industrial control of operational technology systems. So we'll see where that goes, uh, and hopefully have some good news to share uh, over the over the next few months. Right. So uh, we d- we did see at the title that you know it had a few elements. Cyber resilience had a few elements, but let's see what what Daniel. Uh, Dobrovsky from the World Economic Forum said, uh, you know, a short while ago, and and I, I thought this was a really nice encapsulation of of our representation of what this what this actually means. Um, the idea of resilience in its basic form is an evaluation of what happens before, during, and after a disruption, and uh, you know it should not be associated or should not be taken synonymously with with recovery as we we we're all grown up to with BCP DRP. And, and and the other important thing is that it is not event specific or it is not uh, you know an incident bound. 
it's it's something that has to be stitched in it has to be embedded into your corporate strategy and and, and your business objectives from from a long term perspective so uh, whilst it has a heavy footing on the technical on the tactical side uh, you have to definitely stitch that into your strategic aspects uh, otherwise you're not going to be looking for resilience you're going to be looking for pockets of uh, capabilities and pockets of um, of, of of some level of, of of ability to respond to an incident. Now that's not good enough when you look at major organizations, especially those where many of us work, which is critical infrastructure. You know, we need to make sure that we're we're helping uh, you know our organizations contribute back to our societies, to our countries. Uh, you know, be it GDP, be it national security, be it be it any of those. So we we need to be very cognizant of those things. And you know, as business plans for uh, you know, for profitability and, and adaptability, resilience is something that has to be, you know, a top agenda item on, on, on the corporate uh, uh, list of things to do. Uh, so what do we have for today? Uh, so, you know, my, my usual practice is I, I start up with the why. Simon Sinek has always encouraged that and, and I tend to follow that practice. We need to know why we're doing certain things. And, you know, the world we are in has changed. Uh, the world, you know, the, the adversaries that we are uh, up against have also changed their tactics and techniques and, and, and tools. Uh, and, and, and it's quite important that we sort of look at it from the new perspective. And uh, the reason I call the second topic of today a different perspective is because, as I said, we've, we've all grown up in our, you know, and, and we've also been educated in our certifications with BCP, DRP. But it's only lately that they've actually started using the word resilience. Uh, and, 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 and as you saw with Daniel's uh, definition, uh, it, it, it's not the same thing. It's similar, but it's not the same thing. Um, the next thing is, you know, what we're going to look at how different organizations at a global level uh, in, in a fairly recent survey has, has sort of categorized between people who are doing this amazingly well and people who are, uh, you know, still trying to catch up and, and, and some who really haven't uh, got a clue of what's happening around them. Um, the, the fourth uh, topic we'll get to is, is what I call the three C's. So if you've seen my talks before, um, I have the habit of using the power of three. Um, so the, the first hint I'll drop on this one is, you've already seen that in the title uh, with, with, with one of the Cs, and, and then we'll get to the depth of uh, the remaining Cs as we go. And then finally, reinforcement is, is very crucial in any discussion. Um, I'm learning, you're learning, so you know, it's very important we, we stitch it all together and make sure that we wrap it up properly, so there's a pro proper summary of it. And it also helps us sort of gather our thoughts and, and also you know, get our questions in order once we get to that point. Right, so disruptions of, an, of a new order. Uh, the world as we know has, has, has really changed and I, I don't just mean it because of the pandemic. I, I also mean it you know, with regards to a lot of the changes that we've seen in the, in the nature of cyber attacks and the nature of, of different uh, vectors and, and, and practices that we've seen adversaries use against organizations. Uh, and, and there's also a, you know, a, a really big shift in, in who the actual targets are. Um, so on the top, you know, on, on that graphic on the left, you'd see the, the usual suspects, right? You've got data leakage, you've got phishing, uh, you've got the vipers and the likes of them. But as you, get, as you start coming down, uh, you will start seeing a lot more of attacks against industrial control systems. You will start seeing ransomware, not just against small organizations, but at, at a city and state level, and in some cases at a country level. Um, you also see nation state attacks. Uh, APT has been a jargon that's been, that's, it's been there since about 2017. Uh, it's, it's, it's morphed into different forms now, and, and we're seeing a lot more of variants of that blended in with some of the other vectors uh, that, that you see on the list here. Uh, another, attack, uh, another, another attack vector that we see often is supply chain. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of the debate that's happening between why certain countries don't prefer to work with certain manufacturers or principals from other countries is there's a lot of suspicion on uh, you know, uh, on, on, on tampering or compromise of the supply chain. Uh, and, and that eventually then leading to, you know, uh, data leakage and then espionage and things like that. So uh, a lot, lot of that, it's, it's, it's not just purely politically driven. Uh, a lot of countries and organizations do have their concerns. Um, and again, we leave it to them to, to come to their conclusions on, on what they think and why they do act in a particular manner. Uh, when you look at headlines, uh, we've seen pretty much the, the whole spectrum coming through. Um, you know, infrastructure providers like, like airports, airlines, um, aluminum and steel smelters. Uh, we've just recently seen a, in the past few weeks uh, uh, Natanz attack uh, with, with the DMS Stuxnet 2. And, and interestingly, the, the, the victim nation has, has not completely uh, discounted the possibility of it being a cyber attack. We've seen, uh, you know, about last year, the country of Georgia being hit by cyber attack. 
and uh, you know we've also seen the likes of uh, Russia and Ukraine going at each other with the with the likes of the black energy uh, and and the grey energy malware, which attacked its uh, power infrastructure. Sure. So so what you're seeing now is 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 a huge shift from from you know certain organizations or brands. So a few years ago we saw companies like uh, Microsoft and 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 uh, you know Sony's PlayStation and and movie you know services being attacked. Uh, and then again, a lot of that was you know, either taking a swing at, at an entity that was a, a big brand and reputation for a country uh, or, or just pretty much just making a point. You know, it's, 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 it's an enhanced or, or, an, or an activated form of activism. <coughs> what you're seeing now is, is, is completely different. It's, you're seeing nations help to run, you know, core capabilities and operational environments being disrupted. And and uh, it's not just being held to ransom and and and, and in one of the talks I did allude to a, a topic about uh, cyber physical attacks and what we call the 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 uh, the kinetic attack and kinetic attacks are pretty much what you see with the likes of what's happened in in Germany with the, with the aluminium smelter in 2016, uh, what we've seen previously with uh, with some of the attacks that's happened in the region where uh, an attack starts off as being digital. And then it ends up, uh, you know, posing a threat to human life and safety. And this is why we call it kinetic, because you know it blends off from being digital into the physical realm. And and an outcome of that is you actually put people's life uh, to threat, let alone damage to property and 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 and, and uh, operational capability. You know, be it manufacturing, be it uh, be it even uh, utility. Uh, I talked about ransomware, and then we saw a few headlines that talked about countries uh, or cities rather who've been affected. So this this slide represents uh, you know, attacks that happened uh, predominantly using ransomware, uh, multiple cities in about eight states in the United States across uh, 2018 to 2019. Now, what's interesting is how each of them uh, handled it and what it actually costs them in terms of uh, you know, recovery and also you know, what it costs them for the ones who chose to pay ransom. Um, and, and what you'd see here is you know, when, it, when it initially started off with Atlanta, uh, Atlanta um, the ask for, or the demand uh, of the ransom from the attackers were uh, about fifty thousand dollars worth in Bitcoin, um, and and what Atlanta did immediately was, uh, and these are the early dates of ransomware, where cities who had absolutely no clue about managing these kinds of events, corporates were obviously much more equipped, better equipped. They actually did pay up, and and guess what? Uh, you know, adversaries being as trustworthy as as they, as they are. Uh, and obviously didn't didn't uh, provide them the, the level of uh, coverage that was required. So for the 50,000 that they paid or rather lost, they had to spend another 3.7 million in cost of recovery. And, and the loss of the actual loss of revenue to the to the uh, to the city of Atlanta, they never disclosed it. Uh, this was a case where they did actually pay. Now, when you move on to May of 2019 in Baltimore, um, again, uh, an attack, similar attack, there was about 13 bitcoins or about 76,000 worth of a demand, they pay, chose to pay nothing. But in fact, in this case, the cost of recovery and the loss of revenue again was 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 mind numbing. It's about eighteen million dollars. Um, and so, so you see the uh, you know both sides of what the equation where the ones who pay and obviously lose their money, and the ones who don't pay, I mean the the, the attackers don't make much out of it. But what does result is your actual cost of recovery, and this being a city, you know there's there's revenues lost when services and city services. Uh, or, or rather, governmental services come to a halt, and all of that just uh, accumulated to about 18 million. Uh, the next one was not too far away, so it was in June 2019 uh, in Lake City, Florida. Uh, in this case, there was a much bigger demand, so it was about 42 bitcoins, a little short of half a million US dollars. Uh, in fact, in this case, the city chose to pay the amount, but they never then dic disclosed what the cost of recovery and, and, and revenue was. Uh, and then the final one in this uh, timeline is, is July of 29. And, and New Bedford actually uh, got a lot of kudos from the, uh, you know, the community and, 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 and across the U.S. for the way they handled it. So whilst the attack was about, uh, you know, about, uh, about 5.3 5 million uh, as, as a demand, they chose to pay nothing. But interestingly, all that cost them was about a million dollars. Now, now, that's really interesting because what they did was uh, they did engage with the attackers. Uh, but they used the time to then allow uh, you know, their internal IT teams and their consultants to uh, recover as many systems as possible. Now, the reason for that, had, they had some level of resilience and some level of business continuity practices in place. And that was obviously you know, a reflection of the maturity that, that, they, that they had built up over the years. 
The other thing that also invested in, and this is a bit controversial, was, you know, uh, they, they had invest, invested in a form of insurance, which is obviously cyber insurance, which did tackle for the likes of, uh, of, of ransomware. So for those of you who, who do get exposed to, you know, uh, cyber insurance and you get called upon to give your expert a, a feedback, it's, it's quite tricky because a lot of the providers, at least in this part of the world, really haven't, uh, you know, got their arms around, uh, you know, what cyber insurance uh, or insurance for cyber looks like. What they've tried to do is they've tried to convert a very traditional insurance product or an IT insurance product into, uh, you know, mapping it to a cyber disruption. And it really doesn't work that way. Um, now, again, in New Bedford's case, going back to this, their, their loss in revenue was, was generally deemed as minimal because of all of the efforts that had, they had put in place. But the stall tactics that they did was, whilst they kept engaging the, the attackers, they had a team who was working on the ground, and they made sure that by the time the attackers backed off or, or they disengaged, uh, you know, they were they had pretty much enough capability to bring the city back uh, back to operation, and and that's sort of the the mindset, you know, uh, you know, states and cities need to sort of build into their uh, into their into their operational strategies, uh, and not just you know worrying about running the, the the city. It also needs to be worrying about threats and especially cyber threats that can disrupt them. Now, I intentionally call this lethal lethal conversions because. Uh, a lot of times what happens is not every incident is a breach, but, uh, you know, a, a, a breach is very much stemming from an incident. And, and what you see is, is, is a snippet from the uh, 2017 and 2020 Verizon uh, breach report, the VBRs. And essentially what it shows you at, you know, at, at a quick glance is, is about three times an increase in the, in, in the percentage of successful breaches uh, that happened from the from the number of incidents that happened across industry. So it's very interesting for those of you who haven't seen this report. It's, it's openly available. You can pick it up from Verizon's website, but it's quite insightful because it it provides you quite a bit of industry dimension. So if you were to work in an educational uh, in, you know sector, or if you want to work in manufacturing or transportation or in gas, it, it actually provides you really good insight on you know what what they've seen uh, across their clientele and, and participants in their surveys. Now I'll, I'll pick up a few. So education, for instance, uh, you know, saw a shift of uh, from about 16.5 percent to about 27.8 percent across those three years from 2017 to 2020. Now there's one. The, the final column in both these reports uh, fall under a class called unknown. So they really couldn't classify the the actual nature of the incident or the breach as being small or large. And in which case, what they've seen is there was there was better clarity. In, in entities understanding what the nature of the attacks that they were you know, being subject to. Uh, when you look at transportation, uh, we see that the numbers have gone from 22% in 2017 to more than double, which is about 59, it's nearly 60%. Uh, and then when you take manufacturing, for instance, um, there's, there's, there's a double time, the double fold increase. So 20% in 2017 has now converted to about 41.3% in 2020. So uh, what you will see is across industries, depending on on how they've matured in terms of capability or you know, how important they've, they've become, become in the larger scheme of things, you will see that the conversion rates have also changed. So I'm, I'm obviously not going to go through each of the lines here, but it is definitely, it's, it's quite interesting for you to understand even when you write up your own risk reports or you want to get some industry dimensions into you know, how you're faring against the rest of the, you know, the, the, the participants at a global level, um, and you will get some really good insights on this. Now, when you look at specifically, and I picked the, just the top six from the top 20. Now, what you see on the left side is uh, the, the top six threat action uh, in terms of incidents. Um, and, and what you see on the right side is, is, is a similar count, uh, the top six in terms of breaches. Uh, on the left, what you see is a, a, you know, a usual medley of, of attack techniques, which is denial of service. You, know, uh, you have, uh, again, denial of service from hacking and that from malware. And then you also have ransomware, social. So you, you'll see it's, it's, it's a fairly good blend of, of, of uh, attack patterns and vectors there. But what you see on the right is, you know, a lot of the breaches have actually come because the human element is still weak. You will see that the phishing uh, and, and other social elements like, you know, uh, misconfiguration, uh, use of stolen credentials, and this may be due to irresponsible or accidental, you know, disclosure of, of, your, of your sensitive credentials. Uh, or it could even be it, it. It could even have been that the the entity itself was subject to, uh, you know, a, a brute force attack or or, or a targeted attack. Uh, either which way, the human was the compromise point, and, and and as numbers of the top six speaks for themselves. 
um, you know, all of them have had some compromise of the human element. When you look at the way the attack surface itself, itself is expanded, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what the attack surface is, and uh, it, it's basically, you know, what's at stake when, when an incident does happen. Now, the, the, the flip side to it is, is what zero trust uh, dictates, which is called the protection surface. So you only define, you know, what you need to protect and not look at everything that can get attacked. Now, the reason for all of your, you know, expanded, uh, you know, the attack surface being expanded is because the world that we live in, and as I said, I've been seeing that a couple of times, which is, you know, it has definitely changed. Uh, and at least for, you know, most of us that, that's, you know, that, that are currently here, or most of this, us who have been in the industry for a while, uh, it's, it's well over 100 years since the last major pandemic hit us. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a good number of decades since we've actually have adopted the likes of cloud computing or how, you know, industrial control systems have started getting more intelligent. Uh, in fact, as, as we've really seen through the past few months, how the, the adoption of mobility and, and, and uh, remote services and connectivity, uh, you know, have, have become sort of a lifeline, uh, let alone just being a supporting layer. Um, the other reason the attack surface has now changed is, you know, up until the start of the year, we always used to say that the, the perimeter was as far as it, it went into your pocket, which was a, a mobile phone or a smart device that you carry. Uh, what's happened now is that's, that's blurred even further. And your perimeter has gone as much to the to the living room of your of your operators or, or the people you know the, the supplies that work with you. So the telework teleworker uh, effect uh, or, the, or the the work from home effect has just really redefined what uh, a perimeter should be. Um, because of the way we operate and and a lot of push with regards to you know us wanting uh, us needing to be uh, leveraging you know better cost optimized options and and more agile options, the clouds also started taking a, a bigger role. In the way we operate now, I understand a lot of you know entities and, and organizations in certain parts of the world are sensitive to this subject, and and the regulations that 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 make sure that you know uh, they are kept away from it. Uh, and again, each each uh, country and each uh, region has their own justifications, uh, which which is well respected. But the reality is, whether you like it or not, uh, a lot of services that you use, including that including the one we are speaking on at the moment, has a huge uh, you know, part uh, of, of, of the cloud driving it from the back. It also means that data that, and as, as, we, as, as, as uh, you know, uh, we, we, we sort of selected the record to the cloud, uh, all of the contents that's going in you know, from this session is actually being recorded on a, on a server and a storage uh, somewhere out in the cloud. Uh, so, so what you can see quite clearly is, you know, the, the role of the cloud has just gone, a bit, gone, gone off from, you know, just synchronizing your phone to your iCloud or your Samsung cloud uh, or, or your Huawei cloud to, you know, literally helping your businesses run, especially during these times. Uh, when you talk about, you know, pandemic size disruptions, and, and, and at least for, you know, people who take 60 as sort of the, 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 the norm or the average for, uh, you know, a generation, we're looking at a little under two generations. And for those of you who, who take the 100 as a mark, then we're looking at at least one generation where we haven't seen this kind of dis disruption. I mean, we've seen, you know, uh, smaller health conditions being disruptors. We've seen you know, natural calamities being disruptors, but a combination of, of, you know, people, you know, completely being isolated socially, you know, from their workplaces, you know, the ability to engage uh, and, and, and also how ready your organizations were to, to able to, you know, were able to support uh, ongoing operations. I mean, this is nothing that we've seen in the past. And this is why you know the new order or the new world order is how what what the post COVID world is being now defined as, and you know a few things have come out of this. Obviously, you know with, with any disruption or any any situation that you go through, you have to understand what the learnings in this is. And 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 one of the first things that came up very quickly was that you know organizations needed to be resilient. They needed to be focusing a lot more on agility. You know, security by design obviously was a key thing. Uh, it's not one of those things where you can just switch on a service and then you know, you know, expect to figure out how the security works later on. Your exposure and loss would be way out of control if you did that. Um, so you know, these three things are, are becoming quite crucial into the way you now start to design your your operations. Um, the other thing is, you know, in the past a lot of emphasis was on you being at the office and the operational capabilities, you know, also being at the office. Now what's happened is the, a lot of the operational capabilities are spread across 
the office into cloud services and, and where you reside uh, at the safety of your homes. Uh, but what, what that also means is VPN and remote users that, that previously used to be a smaller percentage of your, your working space or your, or your, your operational surface uh, has now taken a, you know, a much bigger role in, in, into that landscape. And we need to be extremely cognizant of that when you're doing your risk scenarios and your, and your risk definitions, because um, this is not purely an IT problem. It is definitely a business problem. And it's one of those things where you, you now need to start having open discussions where a new risk scenario must be defined and it must be done in conjunction with your enterprise risk colleagues. It's not something that you can do in isolation because what, what COVID showed us was, you know, the complete business had to transform itself uh, at, at the fastest possible time to make sure that damage was contained and you, should, you, you could still continue to sustain operations, especially if you look at lifeline operations like aviation or you know, certain types of manufacturing or even manufacturing having to reinvent themselves. Uh, you know, this sort of resilience is what helps you survive and, and help others survive when, when you need to get through such, such challenging times. The, the other aspect, and, and I, I, I kept touching on it a couple of times in the previous slide, you know, this is one of the, 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 the notions that I've, I've sort of coined. You can't have a no cloud, and that's no with an N-O mindset. You need to start having a, a no cloud with a K-N-O-W I mean, mindset. And that's quite important because uh, one of the reasons we, 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 usually, we usually shy away or, or you, know, uh, uh, you know, keep away from uh, a lot of these up-and-coming technologies is because... Uh, I've, I've got enough on, on my plate at the moment. I really don't want to, you know, take a lot more on. And whilst I'm not having the push to, you know, think and adopt these new technologies, I might as well leave it as a problem, which I'll figure out later. The, re the reality is, as, as, as we've seen so far, you know, the cloud has definitely taken a, a front role. And if you don't know how you're interacting with the cloud or what the cloud is doing to you, uh, you stand at a much more, you know, one, you, you, you're you probably flying on a security by obscurity mindset. And secondly, you're, you're always operating under a false sense of security. You know, you think your data is not there on the cloud. What we see with a lot of the security research going on now is you may not have put data on the cloud, but your, your staff definitely would have, and your suppliers would have put your data on the cloud. And unless you know, you know, know the cloud with the KN, uh, you will not have clarity on what your risk surface looks like and, and what you need to be protecting. And, and, and finally, you know, when, when you look at uh, you know, resilience programs, again, it's not that tech, stri tech drives everything. And, and I, I recall uh, you know, um, a quote by Bruce Schreiner who said, if you think technology will solve your security problems, you haven't understood security and you haven't understood uh, technology. And, and on that note, you know, anything that you approach, especially when you're handling pandemic size disruption, is your approach has to be quite holistic. And uh, you know, it need, definitely needs to, to factor in the people, process, and technology dimensions. Because you'd be making a pandemic size mistake if you thought that I'd just buy a kit or I'd just probably get a consultant on board to help me sort it out. What's the use when you've got a, a, an amazing framework or you've got some fancy kit in your, in, in your data centers um, and your people don't have a clue how, uh, you know, how, how to operate it, how, how to adapt you know, those tools and processes to, to the, the, the situations that you go through. So it's very important that you do a very balanced, uh, a very holistic approach of defining a, a program. And if you already have one on enhancing a program that factors in the people element, the process element and the technology element as well. When you look at the work from home and, and I felt it was quite important that we, we sort of delve a little bit more into this new dimension is um, whilst you've got, you know, people who are still uh, focusing on brute force from the outside. Uh, so you, I, mean, I think just a couple of days ago uh, with, with a known uh, provider or a manufacturer, uh, there was a, a critical vulnerability that was disclosed and um, there was uh, a, a publish uh, of, uh, of uh, self-credentials supposedly uh, of VPN uh, customers that were breached. Uh, so what you're seeing now is because the adversaries also realized that a lot of people are now working from home or working at distance, um, they will then not necessarily go after the, the, you know, the fortified perimeter that you have. It's easier for them to go after the comms channel and then get through secure conduits. Uh, this, by the way, also makes it quite challenging for you to identify these breaches when it comes through these secure channels. The other thing that is also uh, seen is 
uh, whilst a lot of entities have taken the new care and diligence of, of applying multi-factor authentication, uh, a lot of them uh, you know, come in with inherent risks. And, and what you see time and time again is a, a lot of the successful breaches that's happened where you know, your uh, single sign-on or, or your cloud-based authentication or orchestration services have been breached or your on-prem services have been breached in spite of having MFA is because the MFA hasn't been done with the right level of, of, of diligence, uh, the way it was applied or, or, or stitched in. Uh, or in some cases, there were, they were inherent you know, uh, gaps where the patching wasn't done uh, appropriately. The, the other things that we also see was, because a lot of people work remotely, um, you know, there, there are a lot more of a knockoff apps and, and malicious apps that are, are smartly positioned by the adversaries into your AWS and Azure apps. So what you thought you know, that, well, that you were buying in terms of a corporate service or, or, or an application on the Azure or AWS stack uh, would, would, would have been a malicious tainted application where the intent was once you've had it, it was no different from them affecting your supply chain. So they've, they've come on the inside, you've actually paid for them to be attacking you now. And then, and the outcome is that you've got a breach on hand. Um, the other aspect was a lot of command and control because your corporate ass assets were now stretched beyond the corporate boundaries. Uh, and and your, your role was no longer limited to just being a remote user, but rather you know, a user that is essentially having an extended office at home. It became a lot easier to target you uh, through phishing campaigns. And that's, uh, if you go back to the previous slide, you saw that you know, the, the, the top percentage of the breach reason was phishing. Now, when you look at phishing, there's, there's quite a few variants of it. One of the things that's been uh, seen more commonly used is command and control, or what they call the CNC uh, you know, outcome of phishing. So they'd use a phishing uh, entry into your, in, in, to, to, to compromise you. Once you've done that, they've taken over the system, or they've actually put a footprint where they, where they can then use that to, to push through and get into your environment. The, the other problem was also when people were put under a lot of pressure to, to switch modes, um, a lot of accidents was being made. So we, we would classify that as insider threat because an insider threat is not just necessarily somebody leaking information. It's also a threat that can come from you know, your own FTEs or your, your, your contractors that are working on your behalf. So and mistakes happening there. And in, 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 in a few rare cases, we also see collusion where, you know, unethically, you know, quite unsympathetically, people also are tr still trying to make a quick fast buck, uh, you know, under the circumstances. So the collusion element also was seen in some cases. When we look at the different, different perspective aspect, you know, uh, why is that important? Because you need to understand that cyber resilience is quite different from um, just your classic BCP DRP as I started off. So let's see what, you know, how that's been defined. So Stockholm University actually said it's the ability to continually deliver. So this is a key aspect here. It's not you being able to offer services in a degraded manner, and it's not you being able to offer certain services during a disruption. It's the ability for you to continually deliver. And the other thing, when you look at the definition that the IT governance uh, group has put together, it is, uh, it's, it's a, it, they define it as a broad approach where it brings in other dimensions besides cybersecurity uh, to look at firstly defending and then ensuring that you're surviving uh, through and following an attack. And, and the graphic on the, the right, uh, if you ask me to put that together in three words, I'd say, you know, it's a summation of cybersecurity, business continuity, and enterprise risk coming together. When I say business continuity, it is not IT business continuity or it's not IT continuity. It is business continuity at the enterprise or the corporate level. Uh, cybersecurity depends on where you're positioned within the organization. is is fairly self-explanatory. And enterprise risk is, you know, is 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 a group who are, you know, made responsible within your organization to look at all the risks across the board, including the technology risks that can, you know, affect the ability for an entity to operate. And in simple terms, this is what, you know, how how I would simplistically put BCP, uh, you know, or or some form of DRP. It's trying to hold as much of it up when things have started to fall down, whereas this is what resilience need to look like. Uh, if you're familiar with the word a bob bag or, 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 or uh, a punch bag, is, it, it tends to bounce back quickly. And that's what you need. You need to be able to, you know, it can get hammered quite a bit. Uh, as they say in the, in, in the technical terms, uh, it will it, be able to absorb a lot of these disruptions. But uh, the, the big element is it still tends to come back up quickly so that you're still able to continue and sustain operations and, and a lot of that has got to do with how quickly you're able to respond and how gracefully have you reacted once the disruption has come through. Uh, and why do we say it's, it's quite different from BCP DRP? Because 
there's there's a lot more diversity in the in the te management techniques and the tools that are used. The other thing is you're not just looking at RTOs and RPOs, and, and please don't get me wrong, uh, these are still crucial and critical uh, contribution contributors to to entities that manage uh, BCBDIP programs, but and they're also equal contributors to when you start setting up your cyber resilience program. But you have to understand that you have to start looking at other dimensions uh, beyond uh, you know BCP and DRP and RTOs and RPOs. You need to start understanding what your own threat landscape is and what are the potential attack landscape uh, attack services. And and another way of looking at attack services: what are your critical assets and what do they fit? And how do we then start you know, uh, you know, working out uh, ways to make sure that we protect them appropriately. The uh, the other aspect is, you know, your appetite and risk landscape has to be baseline, um, with with uh, you know inputs coming in from your enterprise risk and your business continuity teams, and and finally, uh, you know, when you look at um, resilience uh, and when cyber resilience in particular, uh, one of the things that we don't tend to do much in BCPDRP is layering things. We look at a fairly you know switch on switch off approach where you can switch on to uh, you know an alternate means or you switch down to uh, you know a degraded level of operation or you switch over to uh, a continuity arrangement or, or or another facility that allows you to operate now in in cyber resilience you need to also factor in your layered uh, you know security considerations and, and it's quite important because when we looked at the previous diagram where we had the bounce back effect and a lot of the bounce back is actually contributed to the fact that you put in security controls there you know and, and that layering has happened so before it actually gets to the to the core of what hurts you the most you've re you really layered in the security and, and and the resilience capability and this allows actually allows you to uh, to make sure that you know you're looking beyond just bcpdrp when, when you explain concepts to people and this is probably my academic side coming out now is you also need to give people you know an understanding of what they would need to consider when they are trying to get into adopting some of these ideas and concepts. It's, it's one thing to say it's cyber resilience and you take five or 10 different programs, you will see that five or different programs have 20 and, 20 and 30 different ways of adopting. So uh, what I'm gonna present in this slide is are those few steps that you need to factor in <clears throat> or other stages that you need to factor in, which will then allow you to so at least say, you know what, I think I'm having a few of the key ingredients and I, and I can hopefully start putting it you know, putting out something that looks like a program, and then obviously, you know, as with any program, start to get and look better with maturity. Uh, but you need to have the foundation elements clearly sorted. So the first thing is obviously, you know, get out there, plan, and establish a program. Now, what you see in the in, in, in the bracketed space is no program can take off within an enterprise or an organization unless you have leadership endorsement. So it's very important that you put together your business case, you put together your your problem statement or the business problem statement very clearly to explain to them what happens when we don't have a resilience program, especially what happens when you don't have a cyber resilience program. And once your leaders at your board level or at your executive level have, have, have signed into this thought process, uh, then the ball starts rolling. Otherwise, what would be happening is you'd be the, you know, the, the lone warrior, you'd be you know, that, uh, that, the champion of resilience, uh, burning yourself out with, with no real outcome at a corporate or on enterprise level. And, and the other thing is, because there's a lot of collaboration involved in when you do uh, cyber resilience, uh, when you don't have that top-down approach, it, 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 it'll be extremely challenging for you to engage with other teams and, 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 and colleagues within your organization for you to get them to sync up and align with, with the same thought process and outcomes. Uh, the other thing you need to do, and this is quite similar to what you do in your uh, BCP DRP, is you need to define your criticality tiers. Now here, this, you could call it a tier, you could call it a level, you could call it a group, uh, you know, whatever works in your environment. And, and, and for many of these things, I, I, I honestly don't, I honestly believe that there is no one size fits all. So you need to clearly understand how you're gonna define your criticality and what are the thresholds you define within the criticality. And you can even have sub tiers and sub criticality defined between them as well. Now, this is something, um, the team and I can, I think we, we can take a due credit. Um, we, we, we coined this phrase called the resilience factor. And this is uh, moving beyond a, a qualified way of looking at your capabilities. And we've, we've uh, thankfully been able to pull this off, you know, uh, at, at least at least it's, a, it's, a, it's over a year now that, that we've actually been able to achieve this. So we've been able to quantify uh, and, and let teams know at a score level, you know, how they fare in terms of, so number two over here, uh, uh, is is 
you're defining what are those different categories and what are the different groups and what is expected in those. Your resilience factor is actually now defining how far away and how much capability do you have right now and how far away are you from meeting the requirements of those tiers. And, and when you quantify them and you put scores, so when a team understands that a certain you know, score uh, is achieved at, 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 again, people, process, and tools, right? So you see all three dimensions. Uh, when they see that they've, they've hit on a certain practice, 80% in their people element, which means that people are well, uh, you know, they, they fully understand what's required. They have, you know, potentially all of the trainings put in place, but then they'll see that they're, they're hitting a, a middle score in their process, which means the governance still needs to be improved, but they barely have any technical capability or tactical capability to, to, to uh, address this. And they'd probably have a, a lower score in that space. So when you have that, it becomes fairly easy for you to then start put, putting together treatments. When you look at, when you, when you speak risk language, it becomes easy for you to either fine tune your controls or propose treatments and then start quantifying those as well to say, you know what, some of these I can pull off, they're fairly low hanging fruits, but some of these will require investments. And now it goes back to your earlier endorsement you've had from the leadership to say, this is what I plan to do. Now you're going back to them saying, that's what I really scientifically measured. And this is what we think we need to address first. And these are the things that can be you know, relatively expensive for us. And this is also where you use these numbers to, to justify your, um, your, your, your cost to benefit, right? So your, your cost to benefit in this, in this uh, sense is, am I actually spending half a million to protect a $100,000 uh, worth asset? Or am I spending in 10,000 to protect a $2 million asset? And this is where you can say, you know, if I spend that uh, you know, 10,000 in training up my people, my others, uh, other dimension seems to be stacking up pretty well. And you can really put, put together good stories. And I have a snapshot of, of, of what we've achieved. Obviously, it's, it's been, uh, you know, it's been uh, sanitized from, from sensitive data. Uh, but I, I'll show you a quick snapshot of how we were able to propose and present that back into our business. So, so that helped us uh, contribute back to our, our, our resilience plans. The other thing is with entities, you, don't, you obviously don't have an infinite uh, you know, resource and you don't have deep pockets to fund everything. So this will allow you to prioritize your resilience gaps and risks as, as I mentioned on the previous uh, point as well. Uh, the next one is whilst we're doing it, it's very important that you start putting some of these tools, techniques, and practices uh, you know, into your cyber resilience program. And it's very important that you have your people taken along at, at, at the same time. It, it doesn't help when you've spent months in deploying all of the TTPs or your, you know, people, your, your, your process and governance, and your people don't have a clue, and it's going to take another six months for people to come on board. It really doesn't help. So your people who are at the end of the day, you know, the decision makers, the operators, the, the risk practitioners, the cyber practitioners, uh, they need to be completely in sync with the program that you're coming to bring along. And, and, and as with anything that you, you know, we have as, as, as a program, uh, you obviously need to test it, assess it, so that gives you realistic outcomes on, on where you sit uh, and, and where your capabilities are. And then obviously you feed that back into enhancement into your program again. So it is a cyclic process of, of how it goes through. When you look at the business factor itself, there's a few things that you can do. You know, I think I have some background music. Can be Fatma, would you please close your mic? Would you please mute your mic? Fatma, uh, Fatma, can you please mute your mic? Uh, your mic is not muted. These ladies, all of you, make sure your mic is muted. Sorry, Hamid, go on. No, that's fine. Let me just get this chat box out of the way. There we go. All right, so uh, I've been sort of hopping on this people process and, and, and tools. Uh, I'm sorry. Are we good to go? Sorry. Yes, yes, okay. please, let's go. Right, so. Uh, Fatma. Huh? Okay. okay. Right, so uh, the, the reason I keep repeating people and process and tools, it's, it's one of the techniques of reinforcement. And it's very important that we understand. So you saw on the previous slide, what are the steps you need to factor in? Now I'll sort of give you, uh, you know, some of the ingredients that you also need to look at at these three dimensions. So when we look at people, you need to understand your own personnel and that personnel is sort of expanded to contractors. You would, you would have insourced into your operational environment. 
But it's also important that you have your suppliers and vendors fully aligned with what you're trying to achieve because it doesn't help you when your defined arrangements uh, fall. You know, there's, there's a huge gap between what your expectations from your suppliers are and their understanding of your expectations. So it's not just enough that you train your people, you also then extend that visibility out to your suppliers for them to understand what the, the resilience requirements are. Um, when you look at the, the next dimension is obviously the, uh, the tech, right? Uh, and in this case, you, you need to look at not just your application. So think of it like when you, when you take a cake and you take a cross-sectional view of it, you want to understand what the layers are. And in this case, you start off from your facilities, you start off with the application. And again, application, the way you define applications can be quite different depending on the nature of your organizations. I could, you, you could be calling it services. You also need to look at your network infrastructure. Now, when you say backup and snapshot, that's intentionally done because for those of you who are running virtualization environments, it's, it's, there's an amazing capability called snapshotting in that, which allows you to sort of bring it back into you know, a defined point of time. And this is, doesn't require you to completely have the overhead of doing a full-blown restoration or recovery. But then obviously a lot of us still retain a lot of backup environments. So that backup and recovery capability is quite important that you take it into context as a capability. The other thing is your, your compute and storage footprints along with the data storage points like your databases. It's quite important to do that. And many times what happens in resilience is a lot of emphasis is put on the application and the network. And many a times the data points and data storage besides your, you know, your, your, your SANS and NASs, uh, they really don't look at what is the impact on databases you know, have we defined and factored in the latencies that some of the databases, so when an application doesn't get a database, what does it do? In some cases, it will restart itself, and that is causing a bit of a, a denial of service in itself. So you need to sort of take the cross-sectional view, and then from there on, you, need, and you, you clearly understand, what do I need to factor in at each of these points for you to then say, yep, those are my requirements, those are the expectations, and that's what my capability is today. And finally, when you look at the, the resilience factor, uh, what you then see is uh, from, from the, the process perspective is you also need to, uh, you know, investigate and, 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 and challenge yourself on your own designs and SOPs, which is the architectures and, and, and operating procedures, your run books and playbooks, SLAs that you have internally uh, or, or OLAs, and then uh, your test and assessment reports. So what, what you typically find is, you know, uh, entities would, would do parts, bits and parts of this. But then they would never bother to test it, um, and, and you know we often find cases where teams thought they had a, a fantastic backup system in place because the the job card or the the notification at, at the, the, every morning told the teams that they had a successful backup. Nobody actually bothered to go back and check if that snapshot worked or the backup works. Uh, and the same thing happened in terms of SOPs. The SOPs would have been written five years ago. Your environment would have changed at least twenty to thirty percent, and you know new new tools have come in and new capabilities have come in. And none of that has been reflected in the SOPs. Uh, the same thing goes for your SLAs. You know, you, you've, you have understandings and arrangement between your teams, but because of the nature of some of the technology or the people or the process elements changing, changing within, those SLAs have never been revisited. So one thing you have to be really honest to yourself and, and you need to be very you know, prudent about is when you challenge yourself in, in this cross-sectional view or across these different dimensions, you have to be very, very uh, objective, and you need to be you need to be able to lay everything on the table because the outcome of all of these assessments and the way you quantify it is actually going to help you realistically address these problems. If you uh, if the intent is just to show that we we are okay or we are able to manage, that is not quantifying; that's qualifying it. And every qualification is only as good as a, as a person who's doing the qualification. So, what could be you know, the way, you know, I say it's, I'm really good, a high, low, medium, it would, would, would be extremely different from how, how I see it or any of you in, in, in this presentation uh, who are attending see it. And, and your own definitions will vary drastically. So qualitative is, is, is quite useful. It's, 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 uh, it's handy to have. But in certain cases, you definitely need to have that quantity factor or the quantified factor. Uh, so when we actually came out at the end of our exercise, um, I know we, we were very ab quickly able uh, to, to, to start presenting some of the findings, which then allowed our leadership and our, our, our technology and, and, and business people to clearly understand, you know, what was our gaps? You know, what was the expectations when it came to the different tiers? And how did we fare in terms of the gaps that was there? So uh, on, on the left, what you see is we were able to go by, you know, a facility or an application, any of those cross-sectional elements and define 
what tier of an and what tier of the organization in terms of criticality did it sit? Each one was given. We were able to give it a score, and each of the time the scores or the services were being captured, we actually had our uh, partners work with us with regards to validating it, both from the resilience team and also from the the end operator or the system owner, to make sure that it wasn't again perceptions. We had to keep assumptions to a minimum. What you also see on the on, on the far end of the left graphic is a requirement. So, on on a red, amber, green, a rag, uh, you know, an icon graph, we were able quick, very quickly able to say that CF two was relatively more deficient in in in, in uh, technology, but they they were quite mature in the process and people side. But when you look at CF five, it said that they were only sort of pulling through when it came to all three dimensions of people, process, and tech. When you look on the right side, that's scatter graph. That's also reflecting the rag now. So it says for a tier two, tier zero applications, or in this particular example, it was a tier one application, tier two. It said that for the requirements that's there, you know, some of them fared much poorer than others. Whereas, you know, if you had a green on the top uh, on on either tier one or tier two, it showed that your assurance level to be able to respond to, you know, a, a disruption for a system in the tier was a lot better for a certain application or a certain team or a certain, uh, you know, part of your environment. And it's quite useful that we have this sort of scoring, um, and and be able to represent this back because these are things that the business wants to see. It's, it's not you know we 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 you know we fairly quickly debunk uh, the 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 logic of uh, these are nice to have. These are fully scientifically measured, and based on these, we are able to prioritize what the requirements are. And based on the prioritization, as we saw in that cycle graph, we are now asking you for for uh, support from within the business to say we need to address them. And, and that way, we've got a much more, a much better narrative to give back to the business when you talk risk. Uh, when you look at the maturity graph, and, 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 graph and uh, the next slide is, is very, so what happened was uh, Accenture did a, a study on cyber resilience uh, you know, early in the year. I, th I think it was late last year and, and towards this year. And they did it uh, with about uh, a little short of 5,000, uh, a, a little over 4,500 4, uh, executives in, in about 16 countries and 24 industries. And, and one of the key objectives of this was they wanted to understand, you know, how entities and, and, and leadership across the world have now adopted or, or matured or even not even thought about cyber resilience. So this is a really interesting, uh, you know, report that you might want to look at. Again, this will sort of give you a sense of where you sit. So the way they qualified it or the, sorry, the way they, they categorized this is they, they define what are known as leaders in this space. Okay. This, these are not leaders as, as, as in a forest or a, or a, or a or a Gartner quadrant. These are leaders in, 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 in the way that they have you know, shown leadership in adopting cyber resilience practices. Then you've got the, the average performers. Uh, so the 17% the, 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 the were, were off the you know, uh, 4,500 uh, plus uh, executives and, and, and the companies that they represent. Uh, you know, that made up 75% of the leaders in, in, in that space. Uh, so they looked at cyber resilience, they looked at innovations, and and when it came to you know when when it came to um, the average performance and people who are lagging behind in, in in much of these requirements and and keep in mind that these entities all live in a world which go through the same disruptions as we saw in the start of this presentation. So the landscapes changed, the disruptors have changed. You know the impacts are much more painful, and 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 the need for entities to be resilient is a lot more. So you can see that uh, you know close to three fourths of the of of the attendees or, or the participants in that particular survey. Uh, you know, was still just seen as average. And then there's about 9% who didn't seem to have a clue about, you know, even what cyber resilience or security was. Uh, what was interesting in this study was also, um, you know, a few things that they did acknowledge was that uh, entities were considering innovation. In some cases, the leaders, are at, leaders were adopting innovation. And the overall cybersecurity basics were getting a little better, right? And, and why the, the leaders stood out the way they did was, uh, for one thing, they looked at three things uh, when it came to them monetizing or, or getting value out of their, their decisions. Uh, one was they wanted to have operational speed. And when you say operational speed, it, it, it alludes to one of four, the, the four things, uh, you know, if, 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 not, uh, if not more. Uh, one of them was they wanted to see how quickly or how better were they at stopping these attacks uh, at, at the earliest stages of the kill chain. The other thing they wanted to understand from the, when, when you say operational speed was, how quickly could they find a breach? Uh, once they found it, how quickly and how, how effectively were they, able, were they able to fix it? And then finally, you know, when they did happen, you know, how well positioned were they in, in managing the impact and reducing the, uh, the, the effects of that breach? 
uh, when they looked at driving value from new investments, so essentially, you know, we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uptake of AI and, and SOAR and security orchestration and things like that coming through into the, into the security space. So a lot of them started seeing or tried to start seeing value in how can they make sure that the investments that they put in or the new investments that they put in uh, bought in a compounded return. So one was, yes, they were adapting more faster, you know, you know, uh, you know faster and, 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 and more um, innovative techniques. Uh, of the ones that I, I just stated. But the other thing is, they wanted to also understand how could they use that same investment to protect more assets within their own organization. So a, a lot of them was about also increasing the outreach of their investment. When they talk about sustaining what they have, uh, essentially where well, the leaders really uh, played smart and they understood the, the, you know, uh, the, the secrets of the game was uh, they were trying to uh, you know, sustain and build on what they had. Whereas the non-leaders, what they constantly, you know, did, is it a mistake? Is it them sort of, you know, being too open to the, to the, to the experiential uh, effect? But many of them actually spent a lot of time and the effort and the investment in piloting new capabilities. And the problem with that is you're constantly on the change. You really don't get a sense of what is the effect of the investment actually having on, my, uh, on, 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 on me being able to protect or detect or, or respond to these, investment, uh, to the, to these inc incidents and disruptions. So this is where you know, the demarcation qu happened quite well. Uh, the other thing that also came out in the report was all of them across the board agreed that they were hidden threats. They also said that you know, uh, sustaining a lot of this, considering the, the ramp up of a lot of the attacks and, and, and the complexity of attacks, was getting was becoming unsustainable, and and finally, you know, the 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 percentage of investments for cyber resilience versus the returns, they could see that it's, it's started diminishing quite a bit. So, uh, so those are the leaders talking. But then you can imagine for the ones who are still on the on on, on, on a three fourths percentage of the respondents um, were, were you know were far away from even coming to those conclusions or decisions. Uh, what you also see is the leaders were about four times better in, in stopping their attacks. So one in 27 versus one in eight, which means the 26th or the you know, 27, one in 27 attacks is what they were able to block. Whereas on the other side, you know, they, they were getting knackered every eighth uh, attack uh, cycle. 88%, um, uh, you know, they were four times faster in detecting breaches in, 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 within 24 hours. Whereas the, the non-leaders uh, were, you know, just uh, a quarter of that. Um, when it looks at responding to breaches and, and fixing it uh, under 15 days, which is half of a month, uh, you know, close to 100 percent, mean, nearly 96 percent of them had the capability of the leadership. Whereas it was only a third of of that 100 percent that had the capability of doing anything in 15 to 15 days. And finally, when it looks at reducing the pain, the the leaders were clearly you know, having a, a, a two times over edge uh, over the non-leaders. Right, the three Cs. So the first C in this is, is communication. And, and through, the, through the session today, I've been talking about us needing to talk to, and us needing to engage with, us needing to work with, you know, uh, and, and a lot of those Cs are, uh, you know, the first has got to do with that first thing, which is we basically need to be open to communicate and we also need to be open to receiving communication, you know, when, when we have things coming through. The other thing is collaboration. It's, it has to be a give and take uh, arrangement that you have with the rest of the business, primarily because you're talking about cyber resilience with your business continuity colleagues at the enterprise level and uh, your enterprise risk colleagues as well. And finally, it's contextualization. You can't protect everything. And by the same time, you can't watch out for everything. And it's very important that we contextualize the risks uh, very clearly for ourselves and the business to be able to take timely and meaningful decisions. So the first, first one, the, the C was, you know, we said we need to talk. Uh, risk management, insurance, continuity, uh, cyber, cybersecurity. Now, why is insurance important? And, and uh, I know there are different positions and reservations on, on bringing insurance on board. Um, I, I personally am of the view that cybersecurity insurance in this part of the world is not mature. Uh, and this has been with interacting with our colleagues in that di division over the past few years, and, and also with vendors, uh, you know, uh, or, or insurance providers across the region and globally, who who claim to have a cyber insurance product or an offering. When you get onto the, you know, on either sides of a table and have a discussion, you realize they've just repackaged the same candy in a different package, and 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 really won't serve as a purpose. It may be useful for certain sectors where they have, you know, uh, liabilities coming from uh, indemn indemnification, which is. You know, you would be essentially 
representing or, or proxying on behalf of your customers. And you could be subject to, to lawsuits, in which case you might want to protect yourself with insurance. But uh, on, a, on a personal level, I know most sectors uh, may not really benefit much from going on this track. Uh, when you look at the, the other element, which is consult, so you, know, you need to have a consultative approach when it comes to giving and taking, especially when you work with all of them. So you can't have a risk methodology that's exclusive to IT or cyber, and then the rest of the business operates separately. So you need to have uh, you know, um, a combined, uh, 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 you know, um, a cohesive uh, risk methodology uh, approach uh, that that imbibes both, you know, the corporate risks and the cyber risks at the same time. Uh, your resilience framework, you know, you need to be extremely transparent with the way you work and and, and the tools and the techniques that you use at a corporate level. Uh, and I, and again, it's reinforcement. I'm just repeating on the same thing. I'm, I'm trying to package it in real little thought packages. So when you go back, it's, it's a lot more easy for you to then say, you know what, these are different dimensions. These are different pillars, and these are different, uh, you know, approach uh, areas that I need to focus on. You know, I never, I probably never considered my enterprise resilience people, or I probably never considered the enterprise risk people. You know, they were busy preparing stuff for the CEO and the exec board uh, on, on on general risks, whereas it's my duty to do cyber. No, it's it's your duty combined to present to the business to on, to, to to explain what the risks are, and 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 obviously, you know. As, as good leadership practice go, you go in with the solution and the problem statement and not just the problem. Uh, the next C is, is collaboration. So uh, what you would then see is, you know, there's uh, synergized security risks, insurance. So there's, there's quite a bit of synergy you built out. Each of them have their own strengths. So if you can put that together for, for, the, for the benefit of the business and, and the resilience of, the, of, of your capability to operate, uh, you see a huge benefit that comes along. Um, again, you know, make sure that your investments or decisions you make are not skewed particularly to one or more of these three dimensions of people, process, and tools. And then it's, it's very simple. If cyber on their own or resilience on their own are trying to save the organization, ain't going to happen. You know, your resilience objectives are a collective ob uh, objectives for, for the whole business. And it's very important that you sit together, you knock heads together, and you write them together so that when you define objectives, the risk uh, corporate risk team is able to speak on your behalf of, of cyber being an equal, you know, uh, vector or, or, or a disruptor in, in, in the overall operational uh, risks, uh, risk space. And the same thing happens for resilience. When they look at resilience, they're not just looking at the, the operational resilience, they also consider the technology and the cyber resilience. And when you look at the, the cyber security part, you very much have open, you know, good respect and understanding of what, you know, corporate risk expectations are and the corporate resilience uh, requirements are. And, and, and finally, when you look at things, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing for you to go off and do your own cybersecurity assessments and come back with reports and then and, and share reports. But it's another thing, and we see huge benefits in, in this alignment where, you know, when we, uh, we have set up boards and, and forums within our organization where we are able to exchange views and exchange uh, inputs and even share our testing and assessment calendars. So... When we do a resilience uh, drill, you know, we, we do have, you know, people from the enterprise risk and enterprise uh, resilience teams uh, at least being observers. And that really helps them understand how a technology or a cyber function responds or reacts to a disruption. And then we get called into bigger drills that are done at a corporate level or enterprise level. So when they're doing an operational disruption, uh, be it at you know, a certain function or, or, or at a complete unit level, uh, you know, we, we get to see what happens on that side of the world. And that we take a lot of that learning to fine tune our own cyber resilience and cyber security programs as well. So it's very important that you either participate or you observe or you let others participate, you let others observe to, to sort of build that trust. And, and, and you know, and that's, that's one of the things with Collaborate. And this, this C is quite, uh, you know, a C that requires a lot of investment because collaboration requires a lot of time because that's built primarily on trust. People will not allow you to come to their own you know, professional homes unless they trust you. And neither will they contribute if they don't you know, think that you're somebody who's trustworthy for them to, to be working with. Uh, the other thing is, because we still work within organizational environments and there are hierarchies, it takes time to get these endorsements. So collaboration also allow, allows, once the endorsements are set, as we saw in, that, uh, you know, in the previous slide, you will see that it pays off to get these endorsements from the early start. And then finally, uh, the, the other investment all of us have to do in, in, in the names that I mentioned so far is you need to find time to meet and exchange notes. It could be monthly, it could be weekly, it could be you know, quarterly, but do find the time 
chalk it into your calendars and make sure you religiously go and, and meet and, and engage and just focus on these things that helps you know, improve the resilience of your organization. The final C, and I promise this is a couple more slides to go, uh, is contextualization. It's very important that you, you understand and you define what your resilience and, and security contexts are, right? What are, your, what are your priorities? Who and where are your users and systems and data residing? And that will allow you to, so for instance, let's say you've got a, an extremely mature capability on on-prem, but you also have a cloud footprint where you really didn't give thought to. When disruption happened, the knock-on effect was that the cloud services, which was potentially you know, a front or a mid or a back tier for your services, uh, got knocked off. Uh, whilst a lot of the uh, cloud service providers will offer you a quite an, an, a, a reasonable, reasonable amount of, of resilience out of the box. When you look at IS and PaaS, which is infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, you are expect, expected to, to factor in, that into your planning. So you really need to understand you know, what that entire landscape looks like. It's not just on-prem or my data centers. You need to sort of take that 500 uh, you know, feet view and uh, meter view and then look at, put everything on the table and say, you know what, my perimeter or my, my perceived perimeter is this big. And from there on, you know, these are the different uh, touch points and the different touch techniques I need to apply to make sure that I've factored in resilience for each of these areas. The other thing you need to also look at is you need to be very realistic about your risks and what business value are you going to create by addressing those risks. So for those of you who are risk practitioners, you would have very quickly been to earlier, earlier on in your training being told, one of the objectives of risk management is to, is to ensure that you continue or you create value for your business, right? It's not just alone that you are allowing businesses to operate or, or, or managing risk. The value proposition is also a key element. And value proposition is also what leaders like to listen to when you're going into a, you know, a boardroom or, or a decision makers forum and saying, we need to you know, invest in this or we need to take these actions or we need to you know, uh, make these changes to the way we operate as a business. And all of that will happen through a couple of things. Uh, two of them, namely, you know, uh, or the value that you're bringing in back to them is that once we do this, we, you know, we have a fair level of assurance that the resilience capability that we have has increased. And secondly, you know, the security that we are, we are embedding into or, or building into our practice is, is, is very agile. And, and, and the word agility has taken you know, a much more amplified form of, uh, based on what we've gone through in, in the COVID situation. You know, businesses who were agile, yet secure, survived and continue to survive. Businesses who were secure but not agile struggled. And businesses who were extremely agile but not secured also got knackered in the way. You know, they, they got really beaten up uh, uh, or were on the receiving end of cyber attacks uh, heavily when this happened. So, and, and finally, at the end of the day, all of us being security and resilience and, and, and you know, uh, some form of uh, you know, uh, cyber practitioner, you know, our, our main job is to facilitate safe, secure, and, and, and reliable you know, operational capability for a business, be it the right to operate or be it the license to operate. You know? Either which ways we need to make sure that you know, we, we, we are facilitating that practice uh, and in some cases even leading that. Right, so quick wrap-up wrap slide. Um, so again, cyber resilience is, is not BCP. And as Daniel said, it should not be taken synonymously with uh, recovery. It's, it is a, it's, it's, a, it's an aligned practice. It's a practice that you know, is clearly synergized and aligned between cybersecurity, business continuity, and enterprise risk. And the whole thing has to be practiced as a culture. And what happens with the culture is, you know, people will invest time, people will trust, people will contribute, people will take, um, and people, more importantly, will, will make sure they are putting aside time to, to nurture and build that culture. <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, is when it comes to your, 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 own, your own approach, uh, make sure you, you, you plan your program, you prepare your TTPs, and then obviously you practice it. And as I said earlier, it, 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 it really doesn't help yourself as a cyber practitioner or your organization if you sit on a false sense of assurance where you think, you know, you've got a program, the CEO signed it off, the, the chairman signed it off. <clears throat> I, I've invested in all the tools and techniques. They all seem to be checking off, but we've really done, we've never, we've, we've never, you know, uh, we've never tested this. We've never you know, tested it ourselves or had somebody else test it on our behalf. And neither have we done drills or we've probably done, you know, just a handful of them. So when disruptions do come along, the ones who've done the drills and the, and the, and the assessments have a better understanding of what the weaknesses and constraints that they're working against 
during the process of responding to the to the to the disruption. Uh, for the ones who aren't or who haven't done any of this, now they're fighting two fires. They are fighting an internal fire where all of these surprises now just you know you know come into, you know uh, blow up in their face. And at the same time, they've got the disruption that's ongoing around them, where they're now you know really not able to respond and and react back and support the business where, the way they are expected to. And finally, you know, there's uh, the three th the three C's that you need to focus on: uh, the communication, collaboration, and contextualization. And and if you ask me, you know, what is all of this about? You know, we we, we spoke about an, an hour, a little over an hour about all of these things. Um, why is it important? Because today, a lot of the mindset, you know, when it comes to incident response planning and and disaster planning and and all of that is initially we will have some level of paranoia, but that also means that you know, once the paranoia settles down, you then figure out what you have to do, find the, you know, the continuity plans, and then you also have, you know, you've put in the right level of efforts to, uh, to, to recover. And, and, you know, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a more painstaking and a more time consuming process. Uh, what you want to get from is this to this. So as you saw with the punching bag, the butt bag, you're able to take, you know, take the, you know, you can, you're able to absorb the, uh, you know, the, the disruptions, but at the same time, you're still allowing the, the business to, as you saw in the Stockholm University definition, continually deliver what you were asked and what you were set up to do as an organization. Uh, and, and with that, uh, I, I bring the, the talk to uh, you know, an end and I'm really open to take questions. And, uh, but I should have done this in the past. I, mean, uh, I really thank uh, you know, uh, with me and, 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 and all of the organization, uh, organizers for, for giving me the opportunity. Um, and and uh, it's 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 really fantastic that you know we're getting a chance to sort of you know you know engage this way. Uh, you know I learn a lot from preparing for these, and at the same time I learn a lot from the questions. And as I attend, you know other specialists within this group and, uh, and outside, you know it's also a learning a learning uh, process for myself. So again, thanks for the opportunity, and, and I'm, I'm more than open to taking questions. Thank you so much, uh, Hamid Bouzaid, for this uh, insightful presentation. We, we have really enjoyed and been capturing notes uh, throughout. Uh, we really thank you for your time and wish you, inshallah, all the best. Uh, and we'll be waiting for the good news of your master's uh, viva exam results. Uh, I'll leave the floor now to our question. And I will start with the first question written here from Dana Winner uh, in the chat. And please, ladies, do not hesitate then uh, to share your uh, questions either in the chat or um, through, your, uh, through the mic. So starting with Dana Winner typed question in the chat, it said, she said, would you kindly highlight, uh, okay, let me just read from the beginning. Uh, many thanks, Biju, for not using the word hacker or hack. I'm in a mission to er eradicate this word from uh, our infosec cybersecurity culture. And it causes so much confusion in general, in the general public. I have even had students tell me that they want to become uh, or be, to be a hacker. Thanks for using the word adversary. Would you kindly highlight this choice of words and the importance of our choice of words in explaining our risk and remedies to others? Please speak about the negative impact of, glor of, the, of the glorification of hackers. Thank you, Dan, uh, for this question. Right, Dan, thank you so much for the questions. And it's a really important uh, you know, question that's been brought up. Uh, and I say that because even the word hacker is wrong. The, the actual word hacker, and for those of you who have done your uh, ethical hacking courses and, 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 and you know, some of the other associated uh, you know, intuition courses, the, uh, the word adversary is, is, is more politically correct. The word hacker, uh, in its classic sense, and if, if you can go back to Wiki and some of the other sources, you can see that, and even with any of the security forums, uh, it actually came to be associated with people who were legitimately, legitimately uh, either directly or, or commissioned to test out capabilities of a certain solution or a practice, uh, you know, beyond what it was meant to do. So you sort of, you know, pushing it beyond its boundaries. So you are sort of hacking the system to understand what more can you get out of it, right? And and it's not always a negative connotation. Uh, the the right word for people who are there from a malicious mindset or an intent, they're crackers. So they basically want to crack through what you have, and then they get through, right? So. Uh, uh, again, uh, this is something I, I consciously try to bring into in, into you know my presentations or my talks. The word is adversary. Uh, it's it's quite clear, um, and and it's something that you know um, other 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 disciplines or other other flavors of security tend to use quite often as well. Um, and the 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 other thing that you also need to be conscious about is uh, you know when you're looking at you know the likes of ransomware, uh, you know, and then some of those other more tactical forms of of uh, malice. Uh, what, what's really interesting is, rewind, rewind back 
a couple of decades. And what would have happened in the past was somebody would have physically taken something off or, or kidnapped someone or hijacked someone, something, and then held it to ransom, right? What you're seeing now in the cyber twin or the cyber uh, you know, representation of it is, is ransomware. So they're basically holding those same things, I mean, obviously not the human element, but uh, anything or uh, anywhere to ransom against uh, electronic forms of, of, of remuneration. Uh, so in the past, it was a briefcase full of money or it was something of value. Now it's Bitcoins or you know, Ethereum or anything of that sort or anything else of value that's digital. And obviously in the past with, with other forms of ransom, it was a lot more easier for them to go back and, and look. So you're not dealing with script kiddies. You're not leading with you know, just, just geeks. You're actually dealing with people who have criminal intent. And, and I think the, the technically right word is, is an adversary in this case. And so uh, by all means, I'm, 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 a, I'm fully supporting that. You know, the, the, that word needs to be used and, and in, in, in a positive connotation abused a lot more in, 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 in anything that you speak about cybersecurity in general. Uh, and not only that, uh, Hamid, I believe you know, we're getting not only script kiddies, we're go going, I think, reaching to organized cyber, uh, cyber crime. So I yep. think it's getting more uh, complicated as we go. We have a, yeah. a wonderful question also from Anise, and I, I share with her the same question. Is there any resilience framework that are tailored for a particular industry? Example, i.e. healthcare, manufacturing, oil and gas, energy, et cetera. Uh, another good question, Anis. Uh, the the direct answer is I really don't know if there are specific cyber resilience frameworks. But having said that, uh, I can I can say with a fair level of confidence. So if you look at uh, many of the uh, you know the industrial control frameworks out there, so you're looking at NERCSEP, you look at uh, you know IEC six two double four three, you're looking at uh, you know ISO twenty seven thousand one, which which has adoptions for the industrial control. Uh, and then, you know, if you look at biomedical for, for the healthcare, uh, there are local and, and uh, sector regulations and frameworks. And there are also frameworks that come from the likes of NIST and again, IEC and ISA uh, that do have elements of resilience, right? So they, when, when some of them look at it, they look at the full program perspective. So they have people process and tools, but they also then focus on, you know, some of them heavily focus on the tactical side with regards to the controls, whereas some of them look at more on the management side. Um, now, what you will find when you go into those, so for instance, sorry, the first thing what I, what I would suggest you do in this particular case was go back to your particular sector uh, or industry and, and try to understand what are the cyber security uh, or, or cyber uh, regulations that exist today. And see, one of the things you have to understand with regulations is they are the bare essential accepted uh, level of capability by your regulator, be it the government, be it uh, you know an independent body for a region uh, like the EU. So that's a, that's, that's a bare bone essential. Uh, what it would allow you to build that maturity and, and capability of, of you know, tackling this as a program is don't make it a, a compliance centric approach, make it a risk management approach. So you basically want to mitigate and manage your risks and compliance should come along, right? In some cases you're forced to do the compliance and unfortunately that's, uh, that's a reality of the world we live in. You know, checkbox uh, aspect are still there. We all get audited, so we need to comply to this as well. So if, if, if you were to go to healthcare or, or let's say oil and gas, uh, go back and look at, for instance, what NIST has to offer. So NIST has the SB 800, 82, and 83. I think it's 83 specifically. And they have revisions of it. Uh, and in, in those cases, when you find those, then start extrapolating the specific resilience one. Now, you need to be careful when you extrapolate certain data from these standards because... A lot of them are built to be uh, complementing or, or interdependent on other elements within that same framework. So you need to be extremely careful. It's not, you can't just snip it out bits and pieces and put it together and say, you know, I've got my program. Um, your, your, your safest bet will most likely be go back to your local regulator. Uh, and I do know for a fact that the DHA, uh, you know, in, in coordination with, uh, you know, uh, he, he, at least in, in the UAE, you have the local security uh, regulator has worked very closely with the health regulator and they've come up with health cybersecurity for healthcare uh, or, or cybersecurity for, you know, for, for the data in healthcare. And the same has happened for FinSec, which is financial sector. And the same thing has happened for oil and gas and for you know, transportation. So these regulations will be a, a fairly easy start point for you because they will make some references, or they, sorry, they will make you know, clear references to the global standards and frameworks that they've adopted your local ones from. And then you can sort of work your way upwards from there. 
but is that a one size fits all? Definitely not. And then my personal view of this is that you shouldn't go with that approach because even it, you know, what works for a hospital A in a city uh, will not necessarily work well for a hospital B in the city because their forms of specializations, their capabilities, you know, the assets that they carry, carry the level of maturity within the organizations around cyber or, or even technology will vary drastically. So if you sort of try to take, you know, um, a different sized, you know, uh, sorry, a, a certain template and try to place it over your own environment or, you know, a similar environment, uh, ain't gonna happen. You can use that as, as, as a guiding stick, but you definitely need to carve out your own uh, framework for that. I hope I answered the question there. Excellent. Uh and I believe this is uh, there's no one size fits for all. A very valid question, a very valid answer, and yesness is very rich of these uh, references where we can build upon it. We have a couple of more questions, and sure. we'll be wrapping up, up with these questions. So we have from Sonia, who is ultimately responsible for conducting the business impact analysis? What are the approaches would you suggest? Uh, tricky, loaded question. Right. <laughs> so, so traditionally. Uh, the BIA would be done at two tiers, right? And this is uh, at least the way I've seen it in, in many of the organizations. It, it could drastically differ from the, way, the ones that you've come across. The IT would do their own BIA because a lot of the technology dependency is there. And so you would have a technology resilience and the, the corporate business continuity team would do a BIA as well. Uh, in, in, in some cases, they would be talking to each other. So they'd be having some cross-referencing. Um, but in other cases, they, they, you know, many of them would, would continue to work in silos. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking this with regards to some of the experience I've had in the past and uh, I come across uh, some of these some behaviors. Um, Who is responsible? Uh, I would say both the teams are responsible because uh, the collaborative element, oh, sorry, I think the question is ultimately responsible. Um, I would say the ultimate responsibility would, would sit with the, with the corporate resilience. Uh, purely because they are given the primary mandate from your chair or your, your your CEO to ensure that he or she is given clear visibility of the risks to the organization and the ability to respond to them and recover from them. Now, it becomes, you know, uh, it, it sort of becomes uh, an assumed uh, you know, uh, interaction between the, the corporate business continuity and the IT business continuity that at the leadership level that they, they feel you're working together. But the reality is in many times, a lot of them assume what the other one has. Um, so yeah, in my opinion, I think the ultimate responsibility sits with the corporate BIA because at the end of the day, when there's a disruption, you know, be it cyber or otherwise, the CEO is going to pull up the corporate, uh, you know, the, the, the whoever heads up that function, ask him, you know, you know, how are we going to get through this? You know, and who do you need to work with to, to come to an outcome? Uh, but I think the, the collaboration is that first bit, and, and it is a time-consuming process for us, at least at where I work, it took us a good number of years to build that trust. But once the trust was set, uh, there, was, there was very clear demonstration of trust as well. So if something came our way from them, we would take that at full face, full face value and, and, and vice versa. They would do the same for the, for the, with the cyber team as well. Um, and, and it said that, you know, and what happens is it's, it's quite interesting. Once the collaboration comes in, then in one way or the other, the accountability and the responsibility gets shared and, 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 and each party is, is, is okay with that sharing. It doesn't become a finger, finger pointing exercise. It becomes an exercise where when a disruption happens, people come into the same room and they look at the same problem, but give different perspectives of solving it. I really love that when you say, instead of uh, it's becoming finger pointing, it will become like shared. And uh, again, trust is al always there when it comes to collaboration, communication. We need to build that trust with our stakeholders yeah. and even with our, our own IT. And we have each other's we, back. That's, that's the important yeah. element, right? It, it's at the end of the day, it's not about throwing someone under a bus. It's the fact that your colleagues and counterparts, because you've been transparent with them, uh, they are appreciative of the fact and then they will step up to, to sort of work with you or respond back to the leadership when, they, when they're looking for those answers. Exactly. Uh, Buzaid, we have three more questions and we're wrapping. Uh, Maryam oh. Hamadi is asking, says, in your opinion, in your opinion, risk, uh, cybersecurity risk management mature is, is cybersecurity risk management mature enough to help in the cyber resilience nowadays? Well, it depends, right? And uh, again, uh, you, you can't use the answer for one entity cyber resilience, uh, cyber uh, risk management maturity to, to sort of generalize. You can't use the same brush to, you know, to, to paint uh, the picture for everyone. Uh, so in my, in my opinion, I think it all goes back to, you know, how much of support uh, and, and endorsement has, has, 
the cybersecurity function itself being given by the leadership of the business. And, and also, so that's the first bit, right? And the second bit is how proactive has the cybersecurity team been in factoring the, in these risks and making sure that they've been transparent enough with the corporate risk team to, to make sure that you've built that maturity in the cyber, cyber risk management practice. Now, so that's the first part. That's a, that's a risk management part. When it comes to cyber resilience, again, we, we sort of you know, said that a couple of times uh, throughout the session and even during the Q&A. The, the, the resilience element is actually a, an amalgamation of three things. You've got cyber, you've got business continuity, and you've got risk management. So if you know that your own house is not in order when it comes to even quantifying technology or cyber risks, uh, you really wouldn't have a strong position to hold a dialogue with the enterprise risk. So we need to sort of get our own house in order, but at the same time, start extending those, you know, those hands of, of uh, willingness to work and, and, and wanting to, 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 to take from the other functions. So this will sort of work side by side because if you sort of place it sequentially, It'll be a good number of years before you even get to even uh, you know looking at cyber resilience at a corporate level. So you need to sort of fast track your own risk management, the cyber risk management, on one side. But at the same side, you know start exposing a little bit of the risks that you have, and 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 allow this uh, the enterprise risk to understand that and help you, you know, help link those key risks that you've identified. So what happens typically is what uh, you know a cyber risk register would be what anywhere between a fifty to a eighty, de depending on what the nature of, and then the size of your organization. The enterprise risk would have, have see, see things from a different perspective. So they would obviously be, be the custodians for you know, all of the risk registers from the different departments and functions. But one of the key things that they're expected of by the leadership is to, you know, to always or, or frequently provide them with the top five or the top 10 risks to the business. Now, if you've been transparent enough and you've invested into the relationship with the corporate risk, you can very quickly allow for cybersecurity as a risk to go up the rung and be on the radar of the leadership. And this is very important because many times, you know, not everyone will have the reach or, or, or the time uh, or, or, the, or the opportunity to, to, to talk about cyber risk to the business. But what you do is rather than you trying to, you know, shout, at, shout as loud as possible at, 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 the, at the roof of your organization to say, you know, cybersecurity is a major problem, it is a risk, da, da, da. you hand off the risk statement to the enterprise risk people. Let them help quantify it and prioritize it on your behalf you become the SME when it comes to the business wanting to understand what's at stake, who's, it, who's working against us, what do we need to protect, and finally, you know, what will make sure that you know, we are in a better position uh, when a disruption does come our way. So you need to sort of complement the capabilities between both of these teams. I really love this uh, segregation of roles, putting the ARM to talk to the business and uh, reach our uh, voice to them. And we are the SMEs when they need more details. This yeah. is a wonderful set. Uh, we have this, uh, before the last question, is from Zainab Mohammed. Uh, sometimes organization politics <laughs> plays a big role in determining the success of applying resilience across, across the enterprise. How are the three C's can help in that? Well, I'd see, uh, politics usually, I mean, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of any organization. And, and, and the, the degree and the depth and the span of it will vary depending on where you sit within an organization and, and how old the organization is. Uh, you will find that the organization politics are a lot lesser in, in startups. They are a lot lesser in, in, in entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial environments. Uh, and, and they're a lot deeper and, 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 and uh, meaner in, in, in traditional organizations. Uh, how can the three C's? See, at the end of the day, it's, we are all dealing with humans, right? Uh, keep aside the, uh, the, the, tech, the tech side. Even processes will have a lot of human input and requirements for the humans to, to comply with. But we, we're dealing with humans. And, and one of the foundations of, of really good teams and, and organizations is, is how, you, how well trust is established between you, um, between yourselves, uh, both, both functionally and, and, and at, an, at an individual level. Uh, so once you start communicating, and then and, and you start collaborating, you see that the, the element of trust will get built up. Now, why is contextualization, well, I mean, why am I stating contextualization slightly differently or separately from those two Cs? It's because it's, it's, it's like a BI exercise. For those, those of you who've actually gone and done a BI exercise across your organization, you talk to every system owner or a practitioner, their system is the most important thing. Now, the reality of it is a lot of them 
want to state it as a, as a tier one or a tier zero because <clears throat> one, they would expect there is better investments from the, from the leadership. But more importantly, when there's a disruption, they really want to avoid having to get out of bed in the middle of the night and then come off to wherever they work to help support a disruption. So the more they put it on a higher tier, uh, you know, it, it becomes relatively more easier for them. Now, I see that as a form of, of, of politics where you're not really being honest or you're not being transparent enough to help, you know, uh, uh, help the practitioners, you know, contextualize it better. The other reason for contextualizing is, you know, an, an organization is, is actually a, a grouping or a gathering of different functions and capabilities. Now, when you have a disruption that affects people, tech may not necessarily be the biggest contributor to, to managing that risk or the disruption. It would well be HR and, and you know, finance to make sure that people are, are well remunerated. And I'm, I'm talking purely risk management here. So there the context has to be clearly defined that this is a people problem and it's, a, it's, it's an aspect of, of social well-being and, and you know, psychological well-being. But when you look at the technology front, that context has to be clearly defined and you should be able to demarcate what your core must-have mission-critical systems are versus your nice-to-have systems and then finally your you know, um, sorry, you're, 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 you need to have the you're nice to have systems. You need to be able to very clearly demarcate them and then uh, apply your risk management practices, be it the way you define the risks or the way you're controlling the risk or the way you want to treat those risks for the, for the, for the residual ones. So for these three, you know, context is very important. So um, one thing that really helped me, uh, you know, understand the concept of context years ago was, um, and especially from a cyber perspective was, you know, what's wrong with a janitor uh, who, who make sure that your facilities are well-maintained, you know, working in the IT offices after office hours. Nothing. That's part of his job, right? So the context is pretty clear. He's a facility management guy. He needs to come and make sure your, your, your offices are safe and hygienic. But when the same janitor is now in a data center facility, supposedly cleaning up, you have a problem because on face value, it looks like oh, he's just helping you clean up the data center. But there's no reason for a janitor, unless he's escorted, or on a special arrangement to be there, to be doing stuff, unless his intent is he's either been compromised as a human and he's been asked to do something, or he's colluding with an adversary for something that's, that's a malicious outcome. And you see the context is, is just different purely because, not because of what they do, but because of how they do it, where they do it, and when they do it, right? So the, these, these elements will define the context. So that's why context is very important, when, and, and you need to define it very clearly. And that carries through back into your conversation when you communicate and collaborate with the rest of these functions and the leadership. A very good point. And now I'm going to look at our janitors suspiciously. I, I, I was never thought of looking at them suspiciously. Thanks for uh, putting the seed in my mind. Uh, just kidding. Okay, the last question from Mofa, uh, from Mola, sorry. She's uh, again highlighting the cyber resilience and she's asking, uh, who's responsible for bringing this into our organization? Is it, does it need a specialized team? Is it considered as a field, a different field in cybersecurity? Uh, what background of expertise is expected from the, the people handling this? And this will, so, this will be wrapping up. So, so um, I, I really can't generalize again. Again, this is one of those questions about cyber maturity, but I, I can sort of share what we've done and, and I think we've achieved a fair amount of success and obviously we're all learning that we've made our own mistakes on the way, but uh, I think one of the first things that we did was we realized that if we were to try and do BCP DRP or even resilience with core cyber practitioners, uh, cyber security practitioners, we're not going to get too far uh, and you know, you know, with, within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and for that reason, what I did was, uh, you know, uh, I, I was, you know, I thankfully came across uh, a really strong SME in, in resilience and, and, and person's background was mostly with business continuity and, and management, but they really understood the concept of resilience quite well in, in, the, in the broader sense. So when they came on board and I actually had two people come on board uh, in, in fairly short uh, duration. So the first person, uh, they were able to then bring in the, the specialized capabilities for resilience planning and operations. And the other person that, that came on board was a cybersecurity practitioner who, who was able to you know, use that capabilities. And, and yes, to, to, to specifically answer, a, a specialized team is required. Now, uh, I'm not too sure how your, your different organizations work when it comes to, to manpower resourcing, but the only, for me, the more practical way was to extend the cyber team to, to call it a cyber and resilience team. And one of the first things that we did there was 
you know, whilst we allowed the practitioners, cybersecurity practitioners, to focus on core cyber um, and and you know be contributors to the to the resilience plan, we got these two resources on board who then only focused on cyber resilience. But they also had another, so it was 80-20. So 80% of their job was to make sure that uh, they built out the resilience, cyber resilience program. But the 20% was to also for them to work with their other colleagues within the cyber team to understand cybersecurity. And it was a flip situation for the cybersecurity practitioners where, you know, 80, maybe 90% was just focusing on core cyber and 10% was to work with resilience, uh, resilience team members. But because it was one team, it became very easy for the, you know, it became the, the, flu- the communication was very fluid. There was a lot of, you know, uh, ease in, in, in the way settled, things settled in. But because it was dedicated uh, resources within the team, um, again, they were then able to quickly go off, you know, put together the, the wireframe of the program. And then we, we, we sort of, you know, bounced it off with the relevant, again, communicate and collaborate. Uh, we'd already built those relationships in the, in the past. So when we sort of extended some of that, you know, through, we got a lot of positive feedback. Uh, and then we, we sort of uh, developed the program uh, in a way that we could uh, put together a, a three-year roadmap and key milestones uh, for the actual program to mature. So we didn't treat it as a, an IT BCP or a technology BCP program. We actually called it a cyber resilience program from the start. And we made sure we, we, we very early on set up uh, discussion forums and, and boards, which actually had as permanent sitting members, uh, senior people from the enterprise risk and the enterprise business continuity along with the cybersecurity and some of the other security leadership as well. Um, and, and, you know, when you have that, when you have people coming on, on board at the same level, it becomes a lot more easier for us to have the dialogue. And it also allowed the team. So my, my intervention was mostly that at the steering level. And then the teams were very, able, very quickly able to then engage also at a tactical level uh, to, to make sure that they were able to get the right you know, amount, the amount of details when it came to defining, you know, the, 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 the basic essentials with the RTOs and RPOs, but more importantly, get to that point where we were able to even identify our own tiering and resilience factors. Um, so you did, you, even if you don't have a dedicated team, you will need to get dedicated resources who understand resilience, uh, yeah, who, who clearly understand resilience planning and, and uh, business continuity. So uh, I couldn't agree uh, more. Uh, I believe uh, with this we are wrapping, as we promised we committed, that we'll wrap up with this last question. So thank you so much, Buzaid, for uh, this insightful presentation. And uh, if there are m- more questions from our members, I'll pass it to your good self. Sure. And whenever you can, please share the answers. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, thanks all to our members for their wonderful, excellent uh, questions that we have learned a lot from and for the uh, attendance and participation. Thank you so much. All.